Tonight's will be Saka Puja. The full moon in May. Which we're commemorating three events in the Buddha's life. His birth, which was on the full moon in May. And then 35 years later, his awakening, which was on the full moon in May. And then 45 years after that, his final passing away into total nirvana, which was also on the full moon in May. And so we stop to take stock of what these events mean in our lives. After all, they happened 2,500, 2,600 years ago. Basically what they mean is what the Buddha proved about the, the power of human action to find true happiness. Of course, he proved it for himself. And it's something we have to prove for ourselves. They say that on the night of his passing away, the, the devas sang songs, played instruments, sprinkled flowers down on him, sprinkled incense down on him. And he told the monks around him, that's not the proper way to pay respect to him. The proper way is to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, to practice the Dharma the way he did. Because as he said, he found true happiness by developing qualities in the mind that everybody has in potential form. Resolution, heedfulness, ardency. Resolution is the determination to stick with this question of how to find true happiness. Heedfulness is realizing that your actions make a big difference. You have to be very careful about what you do and say and think. Because actions that come from skillful intentions can lead to happiness. Actions that come from unskillful intentions can lead to unhappiness. And because this is a principle that is in operation 24-7, you have to be alert 24-7 and careful 24-7. And then ardency is the desire to do things well. Now, the Buddha never said that he could prove these things to other people, but he said it is a strength for each of us to take them on conviction, in other words, to take them as working hypotheses. Because the principle that our actions shape our lives makes sense, but there's no way we can really prove it. After all, it may be an illusion. But we can prove it through the practice. In other words, you can't prove it ahead of time. But by adopting that as a working hypothesis and then carrying it through, the Buddha promised that it would lead to good results. And so something we take as conviction. He said, this is a strength. And he said, you want to develop the strength to the point where it's a, what he called a faculty, indriya in Pali, which is related to the word indra, which is the name of the gods, or the king of the gods. When, it, when a strength becomes a faculty, it basically takes charge. It becomes the major determining factor in what you do and say and think. And from conviction come other strengths as well. There's the strength of persistence, where you can stir up the energy to keep with it. Because conviction that doesn't result in action is empty conviction, and it never gets a chance to be proven. You say, well, let's act on it. And because the Buddha does promise that it will lead to an, an ultimate happiness, you can take those as words of encouragement so that you can stick with the effort, even when it gets difficult. There's one place where he says, even if tears are running down your cheeks with the difficulty of the practice, it's worth sticking with it. 
because those tears don't last long, but the results of the practice will last long. And conversely, if you give up, the results of giving up will also last long. So you find ways, so you're not doing this with tears down your cheeks, but you're finally finding ways in which you can encourage yourself to really want to do this. And then you want to be able to keep this principle of conviction in mind. That's what mindfulness is for. So when you're making your choices as to what to do and say and think, you keep in mind the fact human action can lead to true happiness if you do it right. And are you sticking with that original intention to find that true happiness, or are you wandering off someplace else? And who's in charge? Is your conviction in charge, or is your greed, aversion, and delusion in charge? Or somebody else's greed, aversion, and delusion in charge? Because the mind is complex. It's like a committee. It's got lots of different opinions in here. Your own opinions, other people's opinions that you picked up. You have to keep in mind the fact that you have to be very picky about what you choose in the mind to follow. You find that when you choose the right voices, then the mind can settle down. The voices that say that it's good to have the mind still, it's good to have the mind solid and unperturbed. Because there are other voices out there that are saying, well, you should always be sensitive to every little change out there. But if you realize that a mind that's solid is a mind that can see itself clearly, you want to remember that. You remember all the techniques that are taught to bring the mind to settle down, and the things that you actually find work for you, that have worked for you in the past. You want to keep those on file. So when issues come up in the mind, you have a sense of what you can do. So you're not at the mercy of whatever comes into the mind. But you can be more in charge, or your desire for happiness can be more in charge. And then based on conviction is also the beginning of discernment. The Buddha said discernment begins with a question, asking people who seem to be happy, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness, and what when I do it will lead to my long-term harm and suffering. means one, choosing the right people to ask this question of. You look for people who have integrity, honesty, they're generous, virtuous. They have conviction, too. And you find that they're pure in their dealings with other people, and they have resolution. In other words, there's a good solidity to their minds, so they're not knocked over by the ups and downs of life. So you have conviction in them. And then you have conviction in that question. Because after all, the, the question assumes that your actions do make a difference, and assumes that long-term happiness is possible. And so the discernment there is in realizing, okay, long-term is better than short-term. And you want to ask the right people. So conviction, when you really develop here, develops into other strengths as well. Persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. And these things come back and they can lead you to a state of mind where you are clear about what's going on. You see clearly what in the mind leads to suffering, what in the mind can take you away from suffering, and you do your best to develop what's going to take you away from suffering, and to abandon what will lead to suffering. And eventually, the Buddha says, you come to a realization, as things begin to open up in the mind, that there really is a dimension that you can touch in the mind that is truly happy, and doesn't depend on conditions at all. That's the point, he says, where your conviction is confirmed. Or verified. He makes the analogy of an elephant hunter. 
there was a time when someone went to see the Buddha and talked to him for a while, then came back, was very impressed. He said to his friend, this Buddha, he's really awakened. And the friend says, how do you know? And the first person said, well, I've seen other people come, they want to argue with him and disprove his teachings, but even before they could have a chance to open their mouths, they listen to his dharma and they're totally converted. It's a sign he really has awakened. And the friend said, well, I'd like to meet him someday. So the friend does go see the Buddha, and he tells the Buddha what the first person had said. The first person had gone on to say, it's like seeing a footprints of an elephant in the forest. You see big footprints, you know it's a bull elephant. And so the fact that the Buddha could win over people with the big footprints that indicated that, yes, he was truly awakened. So the friend mentioned this analogy of the Buddha, and the Buddha says, well, that's not the correct way of using that analogy. So I suppose an experienced elephant hunter goes into the forest, and he's looking for a bull elephant because he needs a big bull elephant to do work for him. He sees big footprints, but because he is experienced, he realizes he doesn't know for sure whether that's, those are the footprints of a bull elephant. Why is that? because they're dwarf females with big feet. But because they are big footprints, he follows them. He comes on to scratch marks up in the trees. And he doesn't come to the conclusion that those are the scratch marks from the tusks of a big bull elephant, because there are tall females with tusks. Maybe those are their scratch marks. But because the footprints are big, they look promising, he keeps following. It finally comes to a big bull elephant in the middle of a clearing. When he actually sees the elephant, that's when he knows he's got the elephant. In the same way the Buddha said, there are footprints and scratch marks all along the path. There's a sense of well-being that comes when you get the mind in a strong state of concentration. And even various psychic powers that can come from the concentration. The concentration itself is like the big footprints, the psychic powers like the scratch marks. They seem promising, but they're not proof. The real proof comes when you've had your first taste of awakening. You see that there is really something deathless there that the mind can touch, and it is the ultimate happiness. And that you found it through your own efforts, through developing especially your conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment, all of these things together. So this is how we confirm for ourselves that the conviction we have in what the Buddha said, or what his awakening means for us, that our actions do have this power. The conviction gets confirmed when you see it. It really does lead to the deathless. So on a night like this, when we're thinking about the Buddha's awakening and what it means for us, try to remember these five strengths and the question of putting them in charge. That means whatever comes up in the mind. You ask yourself, how does this relate to the quest for true happiness? And you do that with an, another quality the Buddha talks about, which relates to his resolution which is that he wouldn't rest content with skillful qualities. In other words, as long as he hadn't reached the ultimate level of skill, he wouldn't say, this is enough. He kept looking for ways to improve his skill. He actually said this is a form of discontent. He was not content with how skillful he had been so far. He wanted to see if there was something more, something more, until he reached the point where there was nothing more. nothing. In other words, nothing that could go further than what he had found. It's just when we develop these qualities, that we're practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. And this is how we show genuine homage, genuine respect for the Buddha. So tonight we've done it both ways. We've shown respect with material things, with the candles, flowers, and incense. The incense stands for for virtue. It's a symbol of virtue. The flowers are a symbol of concentration, the flowering of the mind. And of course, the light of the candles is like the light of discernment. Those are symbols. What you'd want to do is develop the genuine qualities in your own mind. 
And as you do that, you're practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. You're showing homage to the Buddha. And you're paying homage to your own desire for true happiness. Because when the Buddha was teaching, he sometimes it's thought that the Buddha said that we're all innately good. He never said that. And there's nothing in his teachings that depends on our being innately good. But he's got a teaching for people who want to find true happiness. They want to know, can their efforts lead to it? For those people, he said, the answer is yes. And he shows the way. So we're paying homage both to him and also to our desire for happiness, the happiness that we can depend on. Because to get there requires that we learn how to depend on ourselves. As the Buddha said, if you can't depend on yourself, who can you depend on? It's through developing skillful qualities that we learn to find something inside that we can really trust. It takes time because there are parts of the mind that you can't trust. But it's luckily it's just parts of the mind. The other parts of the mind that really do want to do this well, and you encourage those parts. They're called ardency, they're called resolution, heedfulness. The qualities that the Buddha used, that he developed, and that we can develop too. <laughs>